98 Not Out, sponsored by Shepherd Neen, proud supporters of cricket in Essex. Oh yeah, big thanks to Mark Butcher for giving us his new song, Stars Again. Uh, so we say a big welcome to 98 Not Out, uh, to David Gower. David, how are you? Very good evening to you. Um, yes, not so bad, thank you. Who does that Shepherd Neen voiceover? It sounds dead. <laughs> uh, we're, we're not sure. We we thought it might have been Don Topley. It had a very sort of Don Topley <laughs> twang, but Do, Don's a good friend of the show, and um, it sounded like him originally. But no, it's something Shepherd yeah. Neem kindly uh, they sponsor us and the local league down in Essex. So I uh, know, uh, well, no, and a very fine beer it is too. So I'm told, yeah, yeah. 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 From, from my actually no, from my old days or way back, crikey, way back in Kent, um, where there is a lot of Shepherd Neem, mm. and in fact there there's a link between Shepherd Neem. There's a fellow who runs it, who is a keen supporter or member of St. Lawrence and Highland Court, the club just outside Canterbury I played for for two months when I was at university. I think it would be one of the Jonathan Neem, possibly. Bobby, is one Bobby it, Neem, was it? Or? One, one of, yeah. It's certainly, they're, they're the oldest brewery in the UK, so... Yeah. No, yeah. No, well, let's just talk about beer. <laughs> why, <laughs> why not? Yeah. Well, you're Hampshire these days. What's the one... Harvey's is Sussex, Ring, isn't it? Ringwood in Hampshire is the, the, one of the big beers. In <laughs> Ringwood Brewery uh, that was bought out by um, oh Marston's or one of the big players. Yeah, no, I I'm more of a wine man. I was going to say, know. yeah, I was going to yeah, say, I'm, I'm, I'm more I'm more the grape than the hop. Um, but uh, when our pubs are open, it is I mean, actually no seriously it makes a nice change just to go down. I um, mean, we have a pub within a quarter of a mile, um, the Wheat Chief, which has an, a, normally quite a nice little range, you know, half a dozen different ales. And that makes a lovely change, especially actually when we've got sort of weather we've got at the moment, which is, well, <laughs> sadly, reasonably good cricketing weather, but um, without the cricket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of cricketers or former cricketers have got their own wine ranges out. So um, around these parts, Mr Gooch um, tries to plug us with his, uh, with his, <laughs> his wine. Um, yeah. Jimmy Anderson has got, uh, got a, a label now as well. Uh, and um, as I found out to my cost last summer, Mr. Botham has got uh, his own wine. Um, have you tried all of those? Or no, um, <laughs> I have because of because of yeah, I've been reasonably close to Beefy for the last forty years. Yeah, um, and in fact, when he when they brought in first consignment of Botham wines last year, um, there was sort of like a tasting case at Lords. And it rained all Friday, so we tasted the case <laughs> uh, round about to five o'clock onwards, and they called the game off. <laughs> and uh, as ever, as has been the story of my life the last 40 years, when you drink with Ian, yeah. you tend to come second. <laughs> so um, there is some, actually, no, Ian's, Ian's range is good. There's, um, I mean, he's got some really good winemakers involved. One of them is our long standing chum, a fellow called Jeff Merrill from Adelaide, from McLaren Vale. And Jeff is acknowledged as one of the best in the country. And certainly his own range of wines are premium. And he's making one of the premium Shirazes for Beefy, which is in the sort of, I don't know what it's going at, probably sort of 70, 80 quid a bottle. Um, but I mean, I, I wish, wish my old chum well, because he's at least got something to do. <laughs> um, but mind you, having, having seen him the other night, there was, there was a clip on Twitter of both of them in lockdown. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> they did seem to be enjoying themselves. Well, they they were, <laughs> and he's What's... looking. He's looking. How can I say? He's not looking. What was it? The letter S doesn't spring to mind. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like? You just touched on the fact there that you've uh, you've known Ian for forty years. What mm. what what is he like? Is it, is it the same sort of relationship from the playing days to the commentary box days to yeah. to sort of off the field and and, and whatever else? What, what's he like? Very similar. Yeah. Very similar. I mean, he's he's slowed down a little bit, uh, which is very good news for the rest of us. <laughs> um, he, no, I mean, he's uh, it's, it's 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 an extraordinary thing when you saw, when you think how long you've actually known someone like that. Because we started our careers, give or take a year apart, in terms of England. Mm-hmm. He's his debut was seventy seven, mine was seventy eight. Uh, we therefore must have played for pretty much the next fifteen years, uh, most of the time, but not quite all the time together. Um, and as people like Alan Lamb would tell you, the late great Bob Willis would tell you, um, he is great company, um, but you'd need to share him around a bit. <laughs> so your own help, um, you know, a sort of staggered system, a sort of roster system helps. 
Um, but Ian, I mean, Ian, let's face it, Ian is one of the big, well, huge characters of our game Absolutely. of the last 50 years. Um, and when I look back at some of the things he did on the field, I mean, forget off the field, but some of the things he did on the field, he was an extraordinary man to be in a dressing room with because one of the great qualities that you cannot basically teach or coach or train is that sort of inbuilt self-confidence. Mm. Um, and I mean, I remember once asking him on a stage at Lords during another, yet another big lunch just for an Ashes series. <laughs> I said, well, have you ever had a moment self-doubt? And he just said, no. <laughs> um, which, I mean, it is the way he works. Uh, it's not true because we all have self-doubt at some <laughs> stage, but he, bless him, um, just blanks it. So if he's had a bad day, he will reset. Hmm. Um, if he's had a bad year, he will reset. You know, it's all... It's, it's a very good trick to have, actually. But I think both of you, you, you played with a certain panache and a certain style that, in a way, brought some of the flair back to Test Match cricket because at the time of the late 70s and early 80s with the West Indies coming through as well. Test cricket had got maybe a bit dull in the 70s and there suddenly was a bit of flair again in Test cricket. Yeah, I mean, well, it's always nice to be praised along those lines if it's true. Um, the... I mean, if you look at the 80s, I mean, there was Sky did a, a great thing last summer, so looking at cricket in the 80s, England yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. And it was fun to look at, um, but by God, it was up and down. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, we, we were, I mean, the West Indies were very much the dominant side of the 80s. So, I mean, I, I always say to people, if we could just have persuaded them to go and play somewhere else during that <laughs> decade, it would have all been much, much better. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, so the triumphs, you know, things like, I mean, my, my personal best year the sort of the 85 ashes stuff like that um you know those are the sort of things that as an individual you cling on to um there were other notable things through that decade and then you know sort of the various things mike gatting's tour of australia 86 87 um which we're going to talk about actually online tomorrow with i was going to say shall we shall we shall we just make people aware of this so this, this is an association yeah. with black opal travel uh and it's online at the lord's taverners website so just tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing yeah, yeah, well, in fact, the, I mean, <laughs> they're both very good news to me because Lord's Taverners are starting to keep me busy, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, Black Opal, as a travel company, obviously have issues like every travel company in the world at the moment. But they are, they are um, I mean, they're, they're planning ahead. So what we're doing in the absence of travel is these webinars. So we had Zach Crawley um, and Jason Roy a couple of weeks ago with myself and Gladstone. You know, myself and Gladstone are basically both uh, sort of Black Opal ambassadors now. Uh, so we hosted that online thing. With, it's, it's, not, it's not millions of people, but it's just nice to think there's someone out there. And tomorrow we've got, because of the 86, 87 tour is the, 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 the subject matter, we've got Mike Gatting, Chris Broad, who got those 300s in the series, uh, Gladys, of course, myself. Merv Hughes is going to be in Melbourne. <laughs> ah, good. And I'm, we're doing this at four o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm thinking, you know, it's a Black Opal, Lord's Taverners thing combined. So I'm thinking that Merv at two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be, I mean, he's, knowing Merv, he's, he'll, he'll be ticking nicely, I suspect. But uh, it'll still be quite early in the night for him. He's not going to have slept, is he? He's going to be a few, uh, no. a few tinnies <laughs> in, very, no doubt. He is a very good man. He's a very, very good man. I, mean, I saw a bit of him last summer when the Ashes were on. Um, I did a sort of 20, 30 minute thing with some of his, with his tour group in, in Leeds, actually, the, the morning of a game. And Merv is great. He's a lovely, lovely character. He was a you know, formidable opponent, of course, in, in those days, in the mid 80s. Um, but he's just a lovely man. And he, the nice thing, actually, we did this sort of very, very polite Q and A with these Aussies. There's about 150 Aussies in this room, all looking, <laughs> all dressed in their green and gold, all very well behaved. Which of course goes against. It's the not very yellow, is it? <laughs> well, <it's laughs> uh, and at the end of the day, they said, "Have you got a tip for us?" And Michael Holding is our best racing tipster in the Skybox last year. <laughs> had given me a couple of horses that morning, one of which romped home. And by the time we got back to the hotel that night, there was 150 Aussies all going, good on you, mate. And, you know, the horse won. We're all <laughs> we're all in. The, um, the, the series you're talking about, the 86-87 Ashes series, it, it's one of those series that's rather overlooked in terms of Ashes wins, isn't it? It's it kind of... 
England done really well, but it's never one of those ones that, oh, it was a golden series that people seem to go to straight away. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, the trouble is, of course, every, everyone's looking for, you know, a bit of extra drama. So, for instance, sort of Botham's Ashes 81 gives you drama. Um, 2005 gives you drama and sort of, you know, iconic moments. Um, we had, a, you know, a few special moments in that 86-7 series, to say the least. And, you know, for people like Chris Broad, who made his entire reputation on that tour and played brilliantly, you know, three hundreds in the five test matches. You know, he will remember that for the rest of his life, and rightly so. People like, I mean, Gladys, Gladys and Small, five wickets uh, in the innings in Melbourne in the test match that made sure we kept the ashes uh, alongside Ian. Uh, Gladys and bowled a lot better than Ian, to be honest, that day, but, you know, they both picked <laughs> up the five wickets. Um, you know, so all those memories, you know, for the people that were there, it became a very, very special tour. Um, we had people, we had things like, I mean, Elton John became a groupie because uh, he was on tour at the same time. He had voice nodule problems, wasn't allowed to sing for two months, wasn't allowed to speak for a couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> very, like, very unlike Elton. And so we had, so we had one of the biggest rock stars in the world, the brilliant Elton John, became a, a, a cricket groupie, which was fabulous. And he was there in Melbourne when we won that test match. Um, so, you know, the immaculately dressed flamboyant Elton was in the dressing room with his England team all in their shorts and T-shirts. And uh, at least he paid for a lot of champagne, which was very welcome. He, he wasn't drinking any of it at that time either, was he? I think uh, Elton's a very, very generous man. He, uh, yes, he, um, he doesn't mind seeing other people enjoying his largesse. No, it was, it was lovely to have him. It, it, that sort of thing actually... Uh, did, I mean, really did add a sort of rock and roll quality to that tour. Um, you know, he and Beefy have been friends. I mean, I knew Elton reasonably well, Lammy. You know, we had, there were a lot of sort of dinners out, a um, lot of lot of get-togethers. And I, I sort of dare not use the word party as such, because that gives the impression <laughs> that, you know, was, you know, the lack of Mick Jack, Mick was, Jack was, was, was a keen fan back in that way, he still is. But um, yeah. I remember yeah, seeing absolutely. him pictures of him with, uh, with with you guys back in the 80s. Would that have been the last tour that probably didn't get the kind of coverage um, on TV and media that it does now? Um, oh, I'm trying to work it out now. We used to get those half-hour yeah, Channel 9 highlights, didn't we? It was, yes, yeah, so it, was, it was just basically, that's right, it was basically those highlights. Sky roughly started, when did they start? From 1990-ish. It was the West, West Indies, Indies, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 West Indies was the first one they did, I think, to full, full coverage overseas. Yeah. So from then on, that's right. From then on, everything was fully televised, albeit you know, it might be through the middle of the night. Yeah. Um, so at least if you were an insomniac or an alcoholic, you had a chance of watching it all. That's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I met you. <laughs> Now, you mentioned Lord's Taverners, um, yeah. and I should mention that I'm a Lord's Taverner. I'm very Indeed. keen on these things and, uh, and uh, should stress to people that these events that get... Uh, if, you, if you wander onto the Lord's Taverners website and look at some of the events of, of, that, that are going on and that have gone on and that are planned, uh, are always very, very well worth attending and supporting. And, uh, and, and the Taverners should be supported as well because they do some great work now one of the last things that the taverners did before all of this virus um happened was a tour to south africa in february to promote table cricket and um i think you were on that tour weren't you david oh uh, yeah well it's what I, yeah i was um it, and great fun it was too it's it's as we all know cape town uh is a very very special place it was whoever came up with the idea we're very grateful to because Obviously, trying to promote table cricket, which has been one of the staples of Lord's Taverners over the last decade or so, and it really, really has taken off so well for the disabled children that can therefore have a game of cricket with yeah. the table. Um, you know, they don't need to be able-bodied. They don't need to be out in the cricket field. The table does it. But to promote table cricket on Table Mountain <laughs> was genius. Yeah. And to wrap a one-week tour around it was very clever. Um, we finished up the dinner there at Kelvin Grove next to Newlands where one of our supporters basically paid something like 20 tables um, to be uh, purchased in South Africa to get the game going there a bit. So from that point of view alone, it was very successful. Um, and it was there really, we were there to support Lord's Taverners in South Africa, uh, who are you know, obviously not as 
uh, quite as developed as, I mean, Lordstown is, what, 70-odd years, 75 years old now in the UK. It is, so yeah. it's, uh, um, yeah, it's been around for a long, long time, still doing great work. So uh, it's one of those things, I mean, I've been, when I think back, I was invited to be a Lords Taverner around about the same time I was making my test debut for England. So that's a few years ago. And, uh, you know, I've stuck with it ever since. You sort of, they come and go a bit. They've had some fabulous people yeah. involved over that time. I mean, some of the absolute greats of sort of the comedy world, the acting world. Nicholas Parsons, you know, who passed away recently. Oh, I mean, you, you, you could go on for the next hour naming yeah. people. I mean, in reverse order, I mean, the current uh, president, Trevor McDonald, sorry, Sir Trevor McDonald, yeah. the previous one to Michael Parkinson. You've had the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, you know, you, you, it's a long list of very, very clever and eminent people. Um, so, I mean, they... They are, they are a fabulous charity, and whatever they do is well worth supporting. So um, we do our bits, as they say. And on that tour to South Africa, did I spot you wielding a bit of willow? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> one of those things I thought, I mean, every now and again we realised that we'd never know all the answers in life. And I thought I'd got the answer right something about 25 years ago to the question, would you like a game of cricket? And the answer has been no, steadfast. <laughs> um but um, yeah, a nice night out. A very good, very good. Uh, we had a sort of fabulous uh, barbecue, briars they call it there, of course, um, with one of our sponsors in Cape Town. Mm-hmm. A lovely place in Bishop's Court. You know, a bit of a garden at the back with a set of stumps and a bath and a soft. You know, so I was mucking around there, and someone said, "We well, should play tomorrow." Um, Paul Pritchard, who captains the Tavern's team, he said, "Come on, Lou." I said, "I'd love you to just open the batting with me. To, you know, just once, you know." And come whatever it was, five o'clock the following day, I, there I was with the pads on and all the rest of it, striding out to bat as though it was sort of 1985 again. Um, if truth be told, yeah. I should have been given LBW first ball for none. <laughs> <laughs> then I got a nice gentle full toss, which I hit before. And then I thought, you know, I'm starting to get the hang of this again. Uh, and was almost starting to enjoy it, to be honest. Um, but... Um, you, cricket being the game it is inside edge onto the stumps uh, and that was that so I went went back in Pavilion and Salt for half an hour as you, as you always do of course <laughs> it could have been worse you could have been flashing outside off stump uh, well I tried that as well <laughs> <laughs> um, one question that we through last summer so we've been doing this show coming up a year unbelievably yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. one of the features that we did through the summer um, to local cricketers that we talked to, but also to um, some of our more celebrated guests, was um, what's your favourite tea item? Um, now, Mike Gatting gave us a, a fantastic eulogy on the merits of Branston Pickle. Uh, and I was just thinking, with your reputation, uh, rightly or wrongly, as a bit of a bon viveur, um, what your thoughts were on tea items and the best places to have tea? Good heavens. Um, <laughs> well, I was, I was about to say... Uh, um, glass of Bollinger and a leaning full of caviar, but that was just a sort of <laughs> the antidote to, to Gats, Branston, Pickle. <laughs> um, actually, no, that's what, what, no, I suppose, yeah, if we're talking cricket teas or teas anywhere, whatever you want, whatever anywhere. You want. Well, I mean, okay, if you and the trouble is, most of the time, if you're in the most brilliant location, because cricket teas, you know, even if you're at Lords where there's a trolley full of sandwiches and god knows what else. Uh, which Gat ate most of. <laughs> um, you had to be quick. A, to stop Gat getting them all, and B, it was only 20 minutes. But um, if you had a more leisurely time, and a, you know, a little bit of... You know, and a, and a, I mean, just to use the example, say, of Cape Town, now that we've talked about Cape Town, if you were sitting uh, in one of the many vantage points in the Cape, looking down on a bay somewhere, and thinking, you oh, cup of tea and all the rest of it, well... Uh, you'd immediately think, actually, no, let's swap the cup of tea for a glass of wine. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, have a sort of a... Forget the, forget the ham sandwich. I mean, that's just dull. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it works. It works a treat when you need it to. But, uh, um, yeah, a little bit of seafood, just, you know, just a few, few prawns or something, whatever it might be. So, you know, say the caviar blini sounds far too decadent. Um, but... That, that's yeah. That that sounds much nicer. That sounds much more special than your cup of tetlis and uh, or Yorkshire tea and uh, and a ham sandwich. <laughs> Mind yeah. you, I do like a scone. I love a scone. Oh, don't Jeffrey Archer. Um, when we asked him the question, uh, went on about scones and cheddar cheese and being down at Taunton and uh, yeah, oh, we got well, yes. 
and we got into a fierce debate about um, jam first or cream first. And uh, are you are you a jam or cream first man? Oh, I knew you'd ask. I knew you'd ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these tricky questions, you know. Um, I am. Cue the suspense. Cream first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. We're in fierce agreement with you. Yeah, we're in fierce agreement with you. We, we long and hard we debated this last summer about the, <laughs> the, the, the cream or the jam yes, first. Yes, of course, Gatti said issues. it didn't matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the key issues of the decade debated at length. Um, <laughs> right, so um, we know you're a busy man, and um, we know time is precious. But before you go, let's just remind everyone and encourage people to support the Taverners and this event tomorrow. So is it four, is it four o'clock, did you say it starts? Yes, uh, four o'clock online tomorrow afternoon. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, as I say, it'll be Mike Gassing, Chris Broad, myself, Glaston Small, Murph Hughes. Uh, it's an hour of reminiscence. We had, a, we had a bit of a sort of preliminary chat today, and um, as I suppose was always going to happen, with the... <laughs> With the people involved, we, we seem to talk almost exclusively about the things that happened off the field. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of happy, smiling memories about that. So we, we, we need to blend a bit of that, because there's some good stories from that talk. Mm-hmm. Um, blend a bit of that with some of the cricketing memories. I've been doing some research this afternoon, looking back for yeah, my hundred and Chris Broad's three hundreds. And we'll probably ignore Mike Gatting's hundred at Adelaide, because that was a drawn <laughs> test match at the yeah. time. Um, no, it was all. It was a great tour. Um, we'll, we'll we'll mention Elton and we. And there's, there's <laughs> there was a lot going on. I can tell you because we had the we had the test matches, which ended up all right. We had the Commonwealth Bank Trophy, which was the one day series, which we ended up winning. And we had the Perth Challenge, which we ended up winning, beating Pakistan in the final day. And we had things like the America's Cup going on uh, in oh, Perth yeah. while we were there. Harold Cudmore White Horse Challenge, I think it was. Uh, they invited us down one night. It was the usual suspects, Botham, Lamb, Gower. Oh, God. For a very, very <laughs> hospitable evening of fine food, fine wine, and all the rest of it. Uh, which, the following day, one of the things I can tell you about Ian is he'll never, ever admit to a hangover. <laughs> but he definitely had one the following day. And while the rest of us were playing and missing and wafting outside off stump and getting out for naught, he was plunging his head into ice water to recover uh, ended up we sent him out to bat and he forgot to take his bat with him <laughs> <laughs> oh, superb. oh brilliant trouble well, is he then got 80 in about 60 minutes <laughs> <laughs> when he the found one, the bat the one and only yeah. Suri and yeah. both and indeed indeed yeah David thank you so much for giving us your time this evening it's been a fantastic chat um, we will put the links to this webinar on our social media after we finish the show Brilliant. tonight. Uh, and we encourage people to support it, support the Lord's Taverners, even just re- become a member and get involved and see some of the fantastic work that's done. Um, and you may even get to meet Mr. Gower in the flesh if you go along to one of these things. Indeed. <laughs> well, look, it's been a pleasure. Um, wish you guys well. Um, good luck in this cricketless lockdown. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> <laughs> things to talk about but if you can stretch out the, the scones and cream thing for another year or so that'd be brilliant absolutely absolutely <laughs> david it's been a pleasure thank you so much okay thank you very much okay. cheers take care cheers david thank you